There we go. I don't know why they teach linear programming so early in Algebra 2. should be taught late because it's one of the toughest subjects in Algebra 2. Okay. Yeah, I have no idea how to do it. And the well, teacher isn't really much help either. So. Well, it's a tough subject. Uh, first of all, I'm not sure why they even teach it in Algebra 2. It's more like a post-calculus subject. When I went to college, we got linear programming after calculus, not before. Um, but the crux of linear programming is the objective function. Okay. And usually mm -hmm. you're trying to minimize the cost or maximize the profit. You're trying to minimize or maximize the objective function. That's, okay. that's the basis of linear programming. Now, linear programming starts like every other word problem starts, which is defining your variables. Okay. And just like every other word problem, you usually go to the end of the paragraph to figure out how to define your variables. Well, read the last sentence. Um, let's see. How many cups of lentils and how many cups of pasta should you buy to minimize cost while satisfying your nutritional requirements? That's how you define your variables. X is going to be the number of cups of lentils. Now, it may feel like I've spelled out too much there, but trust me, the more you define it, the better off you'll be. It's not the cost. Yeah. It's not the cost of lentils. It's the number of cups. Notice that last sentence, how many cups of lentils and how many cups of pasta? Well, I'm going to make pasta the number of cups or I'm going to make Y the number of cups of pasta. It's as simple as okay. that, going to the last sentence to define your variables. Okay? Cool. All right. Once you get that done, the rest of it's actually pretty easy. You want to consume at least 300 grams of carbs per day. In other words, now we go back to the beginning. Once you define your variables, okay. I didn't even read the rest of it, you'll notice. And I had no idea what the rest of it said. I didn't care. My first step is okay. to define my variables, and I go to the last sentence to do that. So okay. if you want to consume at least 300 grams of carbs... How can I write that as an inequality? Usually linear programming problems, um, hold on a minute, let me think about this for a second. It's usually best if we write our objective function first. Okay, right. so this second sentence looks more like a constraint. You're considering how you can meet these lentils cost that and that, and you want to minimize your cost. Notice that in the last sentence, how many cups of lentils and how many cups of pasta should you buy to minimize your cost? So tell me what the cost is based on these variables. The lentils are 79 cents a cup. Cost? What's the cost function? In other words, uh, what what's, do you your mean? Total, what's your total cost going to be? Regardless of how many lentils and how much pasta you buy, what's your total cost going to be? 
Um, I'm not sure. Well, lentils cost 79 cents per cup, and X is the number of cups of lentils. So, 0.79 X. That's the cost of lentils. Okay. In other words, if you pay 79 cents per cup and you get two cups, then it's two times 79 cents, right? Yeah. Okay. And pasta costs 25 cents per cup. And pasta is Y. Uh -huh. So it's plus 0.25Y. In other words, is that our objective function? That's our objective function. And okay. the objective function, the best way to figure out what the objective function is going to be is to figure out, well, are we trying to maximize something or are we trying to minimize something? A lot, okay. of, times, a lot of times you're trying to maximize profit or revenue or something like that. And so you'd be trying to maximize this function, the objective function. But about half the times you're trying to minimize it. And you can always tell by that last sentence. How much lentils and how much pasta should you buy to minimize cost while satisfying your nutritional requirements? Well, this is our cost function. Now let's write some okay. constraints. In other words, once you've come up with the cost right. function, uh, now let's go back to the beginning. You want to consume at least 300 grams of carbs per day. Well, lentils okay. have 30, pasta has 30, so carbs. If I want an inequality that would describe how many carbs I have to eat, then I get 30x, in other words, the number of cups of lentils times 30 is the number of carbs I'm going to get from lentils, right? If I end up getting three yeah. cups of lentils, I'll have 90 carbs from that. So 30 times yeah. x plus pasta is also 30 carbs per cup. So 30 times y has to be less than or equal, no, excuse me, it has to be greater than or equal. We want to make sure that we get at least 300 grams of carbs. Well, if you take 30 times X okay. plus 30 times Y, that's the number of carbs you get. Okay. Okay. Now, the next thing, no more than 2,000 calories. Well, you also get 160 calories with every cup of lentil. So 106 times, or 160 times the number of cups of lentil will give us the total calories from lentils plus the total okay. calories from pasta, which is 200 times the number of cups of pasta. Okay. And that can be no more than 2,000. So do I want a greater than or equal or a less than or equal? Less than. Yeah. It cannot be more than that. It has to be less than 2,000. And now if yeah. I go back and I look at all of the information in my paragraph, I realize I have it all covered. Just look for your numbers. Is 300 covered? Yes, it's covered by that yeah. constraint. Is 2,000 covered? Yes, it's covered by that constraint. And are each of these costs covered? Yes, in the objective function. Yeah. The cost okay. covered. And every number in this little table here is covered. So we know our variables, we know our objective function, and we know our constraints.
Now it says okay. graph the constraints and shade the feasible area and then find critical points. All right. Let's do that. Okay. I need to open up my page here a little bit. Okay. If I graph the area. Now, the only thing you graph are your constraints. You don't graph the yeah. area function. Okay. The purpose of graphing the constraints, let, let me just, before we do it real quickly, let me just say that if our constraints end up looking like this, and we're in this area right here, then the yeah. next step is going to be to check the vertices of this shape. In other words, I want to check what the objective function is there. I want to check what the objection function is there, 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 and there. And then I will take the smallest number of those five points. Okay. And that's the way linear programming works, is that your objective function describes this shape, and then you examine the vertices of that shape. All right, well, let's look at the only two constraints we have. Our 30x plus 30y has to be greater than or equal to 300, and then this bottom one. So let's graph that. Yeah. Now, that looks like it could be tough to graph, but put it into y equals mx plus b format. So here, let me number these so I can talk about them on my paper. Yeah. I call that constraint number one and that constraint number two. How would I graph okay. number one? Put it into y. Um, put it into y equals mx plus b format. In other words, you want y equals mx plus b. That's the most standard, general form of a straight line. And these are all going to be straight lines. Notice we don't see any y squareds or x squareds or anything like that. Everything is y and x. So if I solve inequality 1, what do I get? I get 30y. Y minus x equals 30. Well, it's minus 30x. Plus 30. Plus 300. In other words, I'm working with inequality number 1. Yeah. I can divide everything by 30. Yep. Ah. There's things about Windows 1 I truly hate, or Windows 10. And that's one of them. All right. So if I take this inequality here, I get y greater than or equal to minus x plus 10. So, yeah. Well, if I go to graph that, that's in y equals mx plus b format, right? Yeah. What's the y-intercept? The y-intercept's 10. What's the slope? Uh, negative x. Negative 1. Not negative x. Remember yeah. the slope. If it's in y equal mx plus b format, the slope is m. And m is always the, co okay. m is the coefficient of the x term. And a lot of people have difficulty with this because there is no coefficient there. That's because it's 1 or negative 1. Well, here's a slope of negative 1. Correct? 
from your geometry yeah. phase. In other words, I want to go yep. down one and right one. And after I'm done, I want to look at it and make sure that that's a negative slope, which it is. Okay. So that's constraint number one. Now let's solve for constraint number two and graph it. Well, if we do the same thing on number two, in other words, we move the x over. Hold on, let's go back to number one for a second. Which side of that straight line do I shade? Because this is an inequality. Which side? Is it the left side? Look to the y-axis. The lower side. Yeah, never say left or right. It's always above or below. Only because we're talking about y. If y has to be greater than or equal to this line, then it's got to be this side here, right? Yeah. If it was y was less than or equal to that line, it would be the other side of the line. Remember, it's y, not x. It's y. Okay. So always look to the y-axis only when figuring out which side to shade. So I'll go ahead and shade that a little bit. Now let's go to constraint number two. Well, if 200 y okay. is less than minus 160x plus 2,000. Okay, now let's see. What can I, I can immediately eliminate some zeros, right? Let's divide yeah. everything by 10 and that'll happen. Now, the next greatest thing I can divide everything by is 4. Okay. Okay. In other words, I can divide that side by 4, I can divide that by 4, and I can divide that by 4. And that's the greatest common factor. If I'm looking for the greatest common factor to, do, to simplify this thing, to reduce it, then I've got to figure out a greatest common factor. I can't divide everything by 8, I can't divide everything by 10, but I can divide everything by 4. And what it gives me is 5y is less than or equal to minus 4x plus 50. Now I can divide everything by 5 to get it into y equal mx plus b format. And there's a simple equation of a line. Where do I start? Um, graph number two. The y-axis. You start with the y-intercept, which is what? Ten. Okay, same intercept as the other line. But the slope now is no longer minus one, it's minus four-fifths. Well, that's a little bit of a flatter slope. It's a slope like that. Okay. And this, I got to be less than that slope, right? Yeah. So if I got to be less than the top line and greater than the bottom line, the area that leaves me is this area that I've drawn lines in here. Yeah. Okay, that's my definable area. And that's a huge part of what you have to get to to solve linear programming. Now, notice that this particular area has three key points. Has that point, which we'll call number one has this point, which we'll call number two, and it has this point over here, which we'll call number three. Those are the right. three vertexes of this 
these constraints. My okay. minimum and my maximum are going to be found at one of those three points. So what I now have to do is go back, plug in these three points into my cost function, and figure out which one gives me a minimum. Well, let's go, okay. through, let's go through these three points. What are the coordinates on point number one? It's the x coordinate. 10, 0. 0, 10. Remember the first coordinate the x coordinate. Yeah. And we're right there. You can see that X is zero. We're on the Y axis. What are the coordinates of point number two? Ten zero. Mm, let me think for a moment. Let's see. This is the top line. Yeah. X has to be ten for Y to be zero. So that's correct. In other words, I go into there and substitute um, 0 for y and solve for x. Well, if I substitute 0 for y, x is 10. And finally, what are the coordinates on point number 3 where you have to use equation number 2? I call them equations, they're inequalities, but the only difference is the inequality tells us which side of the line we're on. But basically we're looking at equations. Now I need the points on number three. I can tell y is zero. So what does x have to be? 12.5. Yeah. So the points on number three are 12.5 comma zero. So there's my three critical points. So if yeah. I go back to your problem, which says write the constraints. Okay, we've done A to find your variables. We've done B, write the objective function. We've written the only two constraints that there are. Graph the constraints. Okay. Shade the feasible region. We've done that. Right? We ended up with this weird looking triangle yep. over here. And find the critical points. We've done that. Um, can figure out how to move this thing left. How do you do that? Let me just do this. Okay. In other words, we've shaded the area of this triangle that's appropriate. And then we okay. the critical points, what they mean is the vertices of that object. It won't always be a triangle. Sometimes it'll be a quadrilateral. Sometimes it'll be a five-sided object. But you've got yeah. to find the x and y coordinates of all of the vertices. And we've done okay. that. 0, 10, 10, 0, and 12.5, 0. Now, if we go into our objective function and plug in those points, what is C sub 1, we'll call it? In other words, what is the cost uh, if I use this point 0, comma 10? Um, Plug in 0 for x. 0. 0.7. Plus 0.25 times 10. What do you get? Uh, let me see. That's just 2.5. Yeah, 250. $2.50. That's what my cost is going to be if I use point 0.1. What if I use point 0.2, where x is 10 and y is 0? 
what is my cost? Uh, you get you get seven point nine. Seven dollars and ninety cents. So I'm not going to use that point because that's a higher cost than C sub one. Mm -hmm. There's one other point there. That's where X is 12.5 and Y is zero. Multiply 12.5 times 0 0.79. 987, 8, 8.7, 9.875. Yeah, it doesn't matter after that. Because remember, the purpose of the problem is to find the minimum cost. Well, there's my minimum cost, and that's the first time I know it. In other words, this point, point number one, satisfies all of my constraints. In other words, 30 times x plus 30 times y is greater than or equal to 300. And it is because I had 10x. So 30 times 10 is 300. Point number two constraint is satisfied because the combination of these two things is less than 2,000. And that's the only two constraints that I have. And you'll notice that on my graph, I only had two lines. I had two straight lines yeah. that were those two constraints. And I had to graph it and then figure out my critical points and then test each critical point into my objective function. And that's the way you go. And your minimum is C sub 1. And it's not absolutely obvious that it would be C sub 1. Uh, it could have been C sub 2 or even C sub 3. Not likely, because C sub 3 has the same Y coordinate and a bigger X coordinate. But the point is, is that when you're doing linear programming, this is the process. Your constraints form a shape, be it a triangle, a quadrilateral, whatever. And then you check the vertexes of that shape into your objective function and you find whether it's a minimum or maximum. A lot of linear programming problems are find the maximum. In other words, maybe it's a revenue problem and we want the most amount of revenue or maybe it's a profit problem and we want the most amount of profit. In this case, it's a strict cost problem. And when you have a strict cost problem, you know, a lot of times you're trying to minimize cost. You don't want to spend any more than you have to, right? But you have to yeah. satisfy these constraints. In other words, you don't want to spend very much if you're running a race, but you have to get at least 2,000 calories because who can run a race without that many calories? And you have to get at least 300 grams. Excuse me, but no more than 2,000 calories, uh, which is a little odd. But <laughs> if I was going to run a race, I'd certainly want more than 2,000 calories, not less. Than, but that's okay. In other words, this is just an illustration. So we have found our critical points. F substitute the values from the critical points into the objective function. We did that, all three. And then finally stating your conclusion, which is, which is the lowest of the three costs? Okay. And that was point number one, which was x equal 10, y equals 0. Is that exactly how I state my conclusion, or do I have to put it in the like terms of cups uh, and lentils? I would say you want 10 cups of lentils and zero cups of pasta.
That'll... Isn't it 10 cups of pasta? Yes. No, hold it. No? I don't think so. Oh, because I need to satisfy the calories, my bad. Right. Well, the uh, carbs have to be greater than 300. The calories have to be less than 2,000. In other words, here's your two uh, constraints. Okay. And when you graph these two constraints, you get these two lines. And it turns out that point number one gave you the smallest cost. And point number one is X is zero and Y is 10. You're correct. That's the answer. Zero cups of lentils, okay. 10 cups of pasta. In other words, I had my X's and Y's mixed up. The X is always that axis. The Y is that axis. So point number one has an X of zero, a Y of 10. Well, that satisfies that. Satisfies that. And gives you a cost of 250, the smallest cost of any of the three points. Okay. So pasta is what you want to buy when you go to run a race. You get the most bang for your buck. Now, it didn't have to necessarily be all of one or the other. A lot of times there'll be a point on these graphs that'll end up being a quadrilateral, and you'll have a point there also. But the, the key thing about linear programming is that your optimum solution is always on one of the vertexes. It's never in the middle of the line. In other words, I don't have to check that point. That's not a vertex. There's only three vertexes to this shape. That's point number one, point number two, and point number three. I can ignore all other points for finding a minimum or maximum. Linear programming is all about finding minimums or maximums, and the only points you need to check are your vertexes. Okay. Oh, so, yeah. Your conclusion should say should say that you want zero x and ten y. Well, what does that end up being? Um, you want zero cups of lentils and 10 cups of pasta. That's your conclusion. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, do you have another linear programming in these four pages? Uh, I have one slightly similar to it. Which and that's on page 131. Is that the second page? That's the third one on the top, I believe. Well, we got a lot of tough stuff in this. We got sequences, systems of equations. Third one, is it one of these four documents? Yeah. The third to the right. Let me open that up. This one? Yeah. Yeah, that top one, I think. That's not really a linear programming problem. But it's similar. It's a word problem, but it's just an algebraic word problem. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's do that next. Okay. Because that's the next toughest part of Algebra 2 is word problems. Everybody hates word problems. Well, word problems are kind of similar in that the very first thing you always do on a word problem is define your variables. So tell me what x should be and tell me what y should be. And x should be an adult ticket and 9 as a child? Mm, that's not enough information. Notice that if I, if I write that, adult ticket, and child ticket, 
Now I'm confused because I don't know if this is the number of tickets that were sold or the price of each ticket. What is it? What's that last? Uh, it should be it should be the price. No. What's that last sentence say? How many of each type of ticket were sold? That's the number of adult tickets sold. Okay. That's very important. For one thing, the problem gives you the price. So anytime they give you something, it's not going to be a variable. It's going to be something that you have to figure out. If you read this problem, they tell you that adult tickets are $9 and child's tickets are $6. So that cannot be the variable. They already gave it. Okay. But what we don't know is how many adult tickets were sold and how many child's tickets were sold. Okay, so oh, yeah. once we've defined the variables exactly, and I can't overstress this enough, is that this is the most important part of that thing. It's the number of adult tickets sold and the number of child tickets sold. Now, okay. sentence number two. On Friday night, the theater sold a total of 848 tickets for this amount. That yields two equations. What two equations yep. do we get from that, given these variables? The first one should be 9x plus 6y equals 6,711. Correct. And then the second one should just be x plus y equals 848. Correct. Now can you see why it's so important that we specify exactly what x is? If we left it blank yeah. and we didn't know if it was the number of a ticket sold, we might think it was the price of a ticket, and it's not. Okay. Well, now we have a fairly simple problem with two equations and two unknowns. Whenever you have the same number of equations as you have unknowns, you're going to be able to solve it. So we've done A, we've done B, and now let's solve it and describe how we're going to solve it. Solve these two equations and two unknowns. All right. Uh, does it matter if I use substitution or elimination? It, it really doesn't. You're, you can use either one. However, let me recommend that you should always use elimination when it's both equations are in standard format. This is standard okay. format. Standard format being right. your x and your y are on the left side of the equation and the number is on the right. In other words, the second equation does not read y equal minus x plus 848. If it did, then I, I, I would use substitution. But it doesn't. It reads x plus y equals 848. So this lends itself to substitution perfectly. Now, how do I solve it using substitution? In other words, our uh, I'm elimination. In other words, if I do something right now, nothing gets eliminated, right? Yeah. So what do I have to do to one of these equations such that I can then add or subtract them and eliminate a variable? Multiply the entire bottom half by negative 9. Let's use the smallest numbers we can. Okay. What should I multiply the bottom by? That Your solution would work, but it requires me to multiply it by minus 9. Wouldn't I rather multiply it by minus 6 and eliminate the other variable? We have to solve for both yeah. variables. So it does not matter which one we eliminate first. Okay? So my mm -hmm. rule on these things, whenever I'm working with equations, is always work with the things that produces the smallest numbers. Small numbers reduce mistakes. Big numbers make for mistakes. So if I take equation 2 and multiply it by minus 6, 
it's lower numbers than if I multiply it by minus 9, right? Yeah. So let's do that. It's still going to allow me, the only goal is to eliminate a variable. What's minus 6 times 848? Um, that is negative 5,088. Now, once I've done that, I generally draw a line through that because I don't want to be staring at a whole bunch of equations and get confused. I'm only looking at two equations now. How do I eliminate a variable? Do I add or subtract? Uh, add. Okay, what do you get when you add equation one to the new equation two? 3x equals 1,623. So what's x equal? x equals 541. Beautiful. Now how do we solve for y? Um, we could take the equation we crossed out and plug in x. Yeah, and it usually is the equation you crossed out because that's the smallest one. In other words, we don't want to plug yeah. in x into this bottom equation. It, the math is much more difficult. But if we plug it in up here, it's really easy. 541 plus 3, 307. In other words, if I use this middle equation 2 here, then y is equal to 307, and the two of them add up to 848, which we need. And it also adds up to a revenue of $6,711. So that's the exact answer. The exact answer is the number of adult tickets is 541. The number of child's tickets is 307. And we would, we would not have been able to figure that out any other way but this one. Okay. In other words, we Sounds did good. two equations and two unknowns, and then we solved that system of equations. And notice that the answers we got were, I mean, we didn't ever come up with that by a trial and error method. Um, yeah. You've got to do it this way here. This is okay. substantially easier than linear programming. Substantially. Notice there was no graph. I didn't have to worry about vertexes of anything. I didn't have to worry about graphing any of these equations. Because all I had to do was come up with my two equations and two unknowns and solve it. So this okay. problem was nowhere near. This is a standard Algebra 1 advanced word problem. Linear programming is a whole different story. Linear programming is very tough stuff to understand. Um, you'll only get one linear programming problem on your test. You won't get more than one because they take so long to do, for one thing. Uh, we used half of our session on the one linear programming problem and almost the other half mm -hmm. on this word problem. Now, I see three equations and three unknowns. Algebra 2 is really tough in the sense that they start you out with a lot of tough stuff. They start you out with... Oh, no, no, good at the three variable ones. Three, equations, are my favorite. three unknowns, you're good with those? Yeah, I like those ones. Good. But they also start you out with piecewise functions, and they start you out with linear programming, and they start you out oh, with yeah, hard work problems. Functions. The, you, you'd be hard-pressed to find four tougher type problems in Algebra 2. You're going to go the rest of the year and not find anything as tough as any of this. And I'm not kidding. I don't know why they start you off like that. You know, it seems like if you're teaching somebody to ski, you start them off on the beginner slopes and then the medium slopes and then the hard slopes. And they kind of do it backwards. And 
all of algebra. It's not just Chatfield that does that. It's every school in the state starts out with these kind of problems. And these are tough. But uh, as you've probably already figured out, when you're solving three variables and three equations, the most important thing is to pick a variable to eliminate and produce two additional equations. Instead of having three, yeah. you end up with two, and this x variable is gone. And that's the key, is the two equations that you end up with, and I would number them. I don't see you numbering them here, but when you're working with three equations and three unknowns, you end up with equations all over your page. And if you number them, it just makes them easier to deal with. In other words, this one, pointing, this one I'm pointing to here, that yeah. really should be labeled equation number four, and the one below it is equation number five. Because okay. that's what we're going to solve next, is those two. And that's a system of two variables and two unknowns. So you can't have an X in there. In other words, you don't want to end up with equations four and five that have three variables. You want to make sure that when you produce equation four, you eliminate one of the variables, and then you want to make sure that when you produce equation five, you eliminate the same variable, not a different one. If you end up with a Y and a Z there and an X and a Z here, you're not going to be able to solve that last final system. So you have to have the same two variables as you have equations at the, when you go to solve this. And then we know how to solve two equations and two unknowns. We just did it in this problem. And that's going to allow you to solve for one of these variables. And then that allows you to solve for the other variable by substituting. And then you go back to one of your first three equations and you substitute the Z and the Y to solve for X. And that's always the way you do these. All right. We have like five minutes. What would you, let me close this page out. Which of these would you like to talk about in the last five minutes? So I think we looked at the bottom one and the second one. Uh, actually, we did not look at the second one yet. You're right. Ah, a lot of tough stuff on this. Sequences. Yeah. Don't like those much either. No. Most people don't. Even though they're, they're actually fairly straightforward, what you have to remember always in math is what is the general formula for the nth term? Um, the term you're on plus whatever the times whatever the variable is. First term plus if it's an arithmetic sequence, which this is. All of these are going to be arithmetic. You haven't gotten the geometric yet, have you? No. Okay. So if it's an arithmetic sequence, then the nth term is always the first term plus the common difference times the number of terms minus one. Okay. So let's check if I'm right on that. What should the third term of this sequence be? Uh, the third term should be the... Um, Look at the sequence. What's the third term? Which one? Okay, so this is for the top then. Yeah. That's 40. Okay, let's see if that's correct. In other words, let's see if a sub 3, that's the third term, is equal to 40. Well, what's a sub 1? A sub 1 is 50. What's the common difference? Uh, minus 10. Minus 5. Okay. 
I got that. Yeah. In other words, every term is five less than the preceding one. N is three, because we're talking about the third term. Okay. So now we get 50 plus 2 times minus 5 is minus 10. That's equal to 40. That means we have the right equation. Didn't really need that step, but it helps us confirm. It helped me confirm my memory that that was the correct general formula. And absolutely okay. need to memorize this. You, you cannot make any progress without memorizing this formula right here. Now find okay. A sub 25. What's that going to be equal to? Let's set it up. We don't 50. have time. 50 is the first term plus common difference minus, minus five. 5. 25 and 25 10. minus 1. It's 24. So your answer is going to be that. 50 minus 120 or minus 70. And you'll notice if you keep going on this sequence, you lose 5 every time. So you can tell that by the 10th term you're at 0, and then you go negative. So the 25th term, that's a understandable answer. Should be minus okay. 70. Okay. You, this formula you got here, 50 minus 5, you don't need that D anymore. In other words, you fill okay. in for D. And this 50 is no longer 50. This should be 24 minus 1. Yeah. N is N. Notice that this 25 here is the same as that N right there. If I was looking for the uh, 17th term, then n would be 17. Everything else would be the same, but n would be 17. Okay. And this is no different other than the common different, or the d is plus 4. Every term is 4 more than the previous one. So that's a good, a good uh, equation, a sub n, only here, before I let you go, let me just do this real quick. In the second one, we're talking about a sub 25, because they want to know the 25th term in each sequence. Well, you've got to start with the first term, minus 3, plus 5 is the common, excuse me, 4 is the common difference times 25 minus 1. So it's, that's okay. going to be your answer, is minus 3 plus 4 times 24. And boy, I see a couple of problems here that looked like they could use some help. Um, unfortunately, you sent me what looks like two hours worth of tutoring and we only had one hour, but yeah, that's okay. If you if you have a test or something and you need to go over how to solve for these, set up another half hour session or so, and we can do it. Um, okay. But yeah, you had a lot of tough stuff on there today. Well, you clarified a lot for a lot of it for me. So I hope so. Although it, it was tough stuff, I really don't think we gave it enough time. I would actually have liked to have done problem 7, problem 8, and problem 9. That would have really cleared it up. And that looks like maybe another 30 minutes worth of stuff. And we didn't even look at all the pages, but we looked at three of them. So. Yeah. All right, Mark. I will let you go. And uh, good luck on this material. This, I, I can't believe how hard they start you off with in Algebra 2. Is this an honors Algebra 2? No. Nope. <laughs> the standard Algebra 2? Wow. Amazing. Standard Algebra. Amazing. All right.
I will talk to you later. All right. Thanks, David. Bye-bye.